under the skies to at least one small corner of Britain. The official residence of the Prime Minister of Great Britain, number 10 Downing Street. The glittering prize for the leaders of the country's political parties as Britain turns to the hustings. Prime Minister Callaghan pleads the Labour cause. Welfare, paternalism, bigger, better and bonnier socialism. Labour's campaign machinery swings into action. There's much reliance on Premier Callaghan's avuncular image. The workers are warned against a Conservative takeover, led by the first woman Tory leader, Margaret Thatcher. Britons of votable age, basking for the first time in the glow of being wanted by everybody, listen as the redoubtable daughter of a Grantham grocer outlines the Tories' plans for free enterprise, less taxation and a bit of firmness with the unions. There's emphasis on the diminishing power of the pound. Margaret Thatcher's confidence grows. But at the other corner of this intriguing political triangle is the enigmatic figure of the Liberal Party led by David Steele, which tries to coerce the voters from the main parties. When the big day comes and Britons flock to the polls, nobody really knows which government will emerge, despite predictions by an army of experts and opinion pollsters. At a schoolhouse in Wales, smiling Jim Callaghan arrives to vote, exuding confidence. If the Socialists return, it will mean acceptance of Callaghan's policy of wage restraint and resignation to the growing power of the trade unions. The media have a field day. After years of living on a slender majority or through courtesy of fickle political allies, the Labour leaders seem almost relieved that at last the tension will be over. Soon they'll know, one way or the other, where their future lies. Meanwhile, the leader must not only vote, he must be seen to vote followed by Mrs. Callaghan. Chelsea polling station. The promise of the first democratic matriarchy grows stronger. Margaret Thatcher struggles through the press to record her vote. And as the results come in, it was soon known that Britain had its first woman prime minister. Accepting defeat cheerfully, James Callaghan leaves the residence he has known for so short a time and drives to tender his resignation to Her Majesty the Queen at Buckingham Palace. Over at Conservative Party headquarters, naturally, there's a feeling of elation. Mrs. Thatcher, accompanied by her husband Dennis, prepares to leave for the palace. At last, after years in almost impotent opposition, Toryism has come into its own with a healthy, clear majority of 43 in the House of Commons. The crowd at the palace, many of them tourists, realise they are seeing history in the making. Mrs Thatcher leaves the Queen after what must have been an interesting woman-to-woman -woman chat, with the government of Great Britain firmly in her feminine hands. At Downing Street, the large crowds gathered for her return will have something to tell their grandchildren. Some far-left reaction is bitter and unforgiving, but in general, Britain accepts the novelty of a woman premier with cheerful anticipation. The lady herself is clearly delighted. Within hours, the many tasks of the new leader, among them the formation of a cabinet, will demand her close attention. Meanwhile, Margaret Thatcher relaxes and enjoys the position in which she finds herself. The brief crowdside chat will no doubt be the first of many. Outlining the future of Britain under her leadership, Premier Thatcher has been quite specific. Less taxation, more production through incentive and a firmer line on defence. By now, nobody in the country has any doubts about the toughness of their new Prime Minister. Nobody questions her determination to do what she says. Next stop, the House of Commons. That's where Britain's first woman Prime Minister will really test her mettle. 